You're listening to Five Things with Lisa Birnbach. Hi, it's Lisa Birnbach and Five Things That Make Life Better for May 8th, 2020. Greetings, Earthlings. As the weather becomes milder, it is much more difficult to stay indoors. I get it. I understand because I, too, happen to be a human being. And I look out the windows and I see the blossoming of the flowers and the trees and the sun. And I just want to go outside, too. I want to walk. I want to buy a bunch of lilacs. And then when those die, I want to buy another bunch of lilacs. And I want to have a picnic. And I want to take long walks outside and not do si six feet from other people. Since March 14th, I have left my building maybe at most twice a week, I think mostly once a week for a short walk or a quick errand in the, in the neighborhood. I wear my mask. I wear my gloves. I feel the sun in my hair. I feel grateful things aren't worse. If that's the new normal, I guess we've got to just accept it and assume it's going to be somewhat temporary. I hope. But speaking of hope, my guest this week is a man who has been able to offer glimpses of hope to the poor and hungry around this world. And his name is Stephen Henderson. Whether this habit of cooking at soup kitchens around the world was really generated by his theological background and training or because of the privilege he recognized in his life, it doesn't matter. His new book is called The 24-Hour Soup Kitchen, Soul-Stirring Lessons in Gastrophilanthropy, and you'll want to hear all about it. It's really very interesting how a guy from New York who has the wherewithal to go to restaurants every night would spend eight hours a day in a slum slicing vegetables happily. And you will hear from him momentarily. But first, I wanted to share my five things of the week. Number one, my mom mug. And there is a picture of this on my website at lisabernbach.com. My daughter, Exhibit B, painted this at one of those ceramic painting studios that were everywhere in the early 2000s. They were called Color Me Mine. They were called The Paint Place. They were wherever. Every town had one. And my daughter painted this mug. I would guess she was between 7 and 10 or 11 based on her handwriting. And at the bottom of the mug, she wrote, all gone. And it is a dear, precious souvenir that means a lot to me. It was in the back of the shelf the other day. I brought it forward. It's now back in heavy rotation. Always makes me smile. Number two, The play I saw last Wednesday night called What Do We Need to Talk About? Conversations on Zoom, written by Richard Nelson. He has a series of plays he's written about the Apple family, a waspy American family who live in Rhinebeck, New York. He's followed them many times since 2010. And this play, which debuted on April 29th online, is set on April 29th, 2020. You can read what I think about it on my website, and I have linked the places where you can try to find it online on YouTube now. I thought it was fantastic. It was a bunch of people in a Zoom, uh, relatives in a Zoom conversation, as many of our families had over Easter and Passover, talking about the same thing we're talking about and thinking about. Number three, reading more, reading again. Like many of you, I'm getting screen fatigue. We've been watching the news and and watching, binge watching TV shows, and we've been on our screens, our phones, our TVs. I like the quiet of reading a book. Number four, my brother John and I saw our mother again this week. That's two weeks in a row. I'm not sure if she's getting as much from our visits as we are, but the peace of mind we get from seeing her in person is inestimable. And number five, my daughter-in-law FaceTimes me often with her baby boy. Oh yeah, I guess he's my grandson. I love watching him walk and pick up every single thing he sees and then attempt to stuff it in his mouth. I'm sad we cannot be with them for his first birthday, but the live video makes the absence bearable. Viva la différence. 
And now, my interview with Stephen Henderson. Thank you for joining us, Stephen. Oh, thank you, Lisa. It's, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, one thing that I have been struck with, as has probably everybody I know, with the demise of outside life, we've all been cooking. Now, for you, cooking is a natural, joyful act. For me, it's a stressful, nervous-making act because it's something I'm just learning to do more and more and more. And now that I have mastered some things, I want to do it all the time for everyone, maybe not also clean up after it. But I know that I could now feed multitudes, well, not multitudes, I can feed people. And just the act of feeding people is such an act of love and generosity. And I think it's that which started you off, right? Well, it is. I mean, I, I, I grew up in a family of seven. So, and I was, even though I was the youngest child, three sisters and a brother older than me, I became my mom's kitchen wench. She had to you know, she had her own life. She had things to do. She wasn't all that interested in just being in the kitchen. And she kind of dragooned me into helping her. And I, I, I liked it. I, I thought it was fun. And so I learned how to do, I learned how to cook pretty early, not haute cuisine by any means. And I mean, you, you raised a point of not knowing how to cook. No one is born knowing how to cook. You know, so I think most people are a little bit anxious where they feel like, oh, I'm going to mess up or I should right. know how to cook. Everybody's just got to start at some point. But at some point when you were a teenager and you had older sisters, you were the kid who was watching the Galloping Gourmet and taking notes so that you could sort of elevate your family's nightly dinner. Well, that's right. And I guess, Lisa, we're, we're aging ourselves a little bit by talking about Graham Caro, the, the Galloping Gourmet. But mm-hmm. he was he was something. He was really funny and a little bit saucy and a little bit boozy. And he was just really fun to watch. And I got excited by his excitement about food. And mm-hmm. I began to bring that back into family dinner. And you grew up as the son of a Baptist minister in a house that had a lot of, I take it, Wonder Bread and uh, American cheese, that there it was a s- time of simple American eating. I mean, that's how we basically ate in my house, too. Well, sure. I mean, it was pre microwave. No one knew from takeout. We weren't poor, but we didn't have a lot of extra money. So we wouldn't just go out to eat on a weeknight, certainly. And so, yeah, I mean, I, we had instant mashed potatoes. Mom would open a can of ragu sauce, um, frozen TV dinners, frozen meat pies. Remember those? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I mean, it wasn't all that way. I mean, we had pot roast and ham and baked oven baked chicken and but maybe not a whole lot of fresh vegetables. And, it, you know, the, the average American didn't know from arugula or basil or uh, you know, th- things we take for granted now. Oh, yeah, I know. I mean, we had Del Monte and Green Giant frozen vegetables. I never sure. had a fresh vegetable until I was a teenager or an adult. But as you became more and more comfortable in the kitchen, and as you and your husband became more successful, you were able to have these lovely dinner parties at which you cooked. And you you tell a wonderful story about how you dreamt of owning a very, very magnificent French stove or oven or range or or <laughs> what do you all call all of the above? Yeah, we, we, we were renovating an apartment in New York and we were feeling flush and, you know, it's a good idea to get things that add to the resale value of your apartment. And right. So I got this assignment from Gourmet to go to La Conche, this tiny little village in Burgundy in France to buy this oven that I had had built to my exact specifications. And, you know, a Laconche is kind of like the Jaguar of ovens where they're just, they're a dream. They're these streamlined pieces of equipment that just, they only make about 2000 of them a year. And they're just, they're really, really great. And I got there and I saw this thing and I just had a panic attack 
where I just thought, what am I doing? I don't deserve this thing. And this is, you know, I'm a Toyota person. I don't need a Jaguar. <laughs> what have I done? And the, uh, the, the man who ran Lacan, who I was interviewing for this story, basically sat me down and he just said, listen, you need to just relax. You can do great things with this oven. And he mentioned this French chef who basically not only invented cooking with gas, literally mm -hmm. invented cooking with gas, but he invented really the idea of a soup kitchen. And, he, you know, it's kind of like, well, you know, it's a journalist. Sometimes you, you hear something and it goes in one ear and out the other. And sometimes you hear something and you think, hmm, I'm going to look into that. Absolutely. So, I, I mean, it turns out it was rather life changing for you. Well, it was indeed, because it made me comfortable taking my Lacanche back to New York with me, and <laughs> and then learning about what I decided, I'm not sure I invented the term, but I'm, I'm hitting it pretty hard, to, to explore gastrophilanthropy, you know, just figuring out how to cook for others in a way that shows them love. Now, you have a kind of mentor, and you you never met him but you've been deeply and profoundly inspired by a British chef and boulevardier and very interesting man named, is it Soyer? It's Alexis Soyer, yes. He Alexis was the, the chef that the, the guy told me about, my friend at Lacan. Right. And he died about exactly a century before I was born. He died in 1858. Mm -hmm. And he, in the mid-19th century, was the most famous chef in the world, hands down. He was, you know, Bobby Flay and Rachel Ray and Martha Stewart and Eric Repair all rolled into one. He was it. Right. And he, and he invented this kitchen at a gentleman's club on Pall Mall in London where he cooked for the richest men in the world, the richest and most powerful men in the world. It was an all-men's club. Right. And he, he invented this kitchen that was such a technological wonder that people came from all around the world just to see this systematized way he had come up for cooking meals. And he was making a fat salary and spent a lot of money on champagne and on his fantastic clothes that he had designed. And then he decides, I'm going to start cooking for the poorest of the poor in London, in Spitalfields. You know, that neighborhood is kind of groovy these days. Yeah. But in, in those days, it was not. It had, it had been decimated. It was a neighborhood of silk weavers, and they had all been run out of business by cheap silk from China. So it was just this grindingly poor part of town. So Alexis Soyer would walk over there in his patent leather boots and his capes and his beret, and he would just start cooking soup for poor people. And he, he, it is. I mean, he's still really in a way that is amazing to me still. So his example kind of gave me permission to attempt to straddle my worlds. I mean, I'm I'm not Mother Teresa. I'm not a saint. I haven't given up everything I have, but I decided that I could try to follow his example. Well, and you know what? You get to see some really remarkable places, both the richest of the rich and the poorest of the poor, very often on the same adventure. I should say that some of what you do professionally is write travel stories. They may be focusing on a, a factory that makes the most high-end ovens, but it could also be visiting a new hotel or interviewing people who do a Japanese tea ceremony like no one else. And then you add on visits after you're done with your assignment, you add on a few days in which you can cook locally for the poorest residents of wherever you are. Well, that's right. And how this started, Lisa, is I had been asked to go to Delhi, India. They were just starting their own fashion week. You know, London, Paris, Milan, New York had had fashion weeks for many years, and Delhi wanted to get in on the action. So I was invited to cover Delhi Fashion Week. And so there I am seeing these fantastically overproduced, you know, trippy, you know, psychedelic, wild shows. And I have a little, uh, a young man uh, who's been assigned to be my assistant for this week that I'm in Delhi. Right. And he was a Sikh. 
And he said to me one day, would you like to come with me to my temple? And I said, sure, that would be great. And so we get there and this temple, this Sikh temple in central Delhi, it used to be a Maharaja's palace and it's surrounded by acres of marble plazas and there's a huge pool about the size of you know two olympic swimming pools where people think a dip into it makes them healed and there's all this you know wonder upon wonder and then my young friend meat was not all that amazed by it but i couldn't believe it there was a soup kitchen there that fed twenty thousand people a day uh, yeah yeah and 20,000 a day. A yeah. day. It's all run by volunteers, and there's no org chart, no, you know, who knows who's going to show up. There's one paid employee. They don't even know what amount of food is going to be showing up every day, but they know the 20,000 people are going to show up hungry. So, I, you know, my jaw is still, you know, kind of hanging open, yeah. just remembering it. Yeah. And so I decided to write a story about that. And then I thought, well, you know, I bet the mechanism by how this happens in other parts of the world is interesting, too. So, as you say, I, I, when I would be in Israel or in South Korea or in Mexico or Japan, I doing travel stories for the right. New York Times or right. for Food and Wine or for El Decor, I added on days, and this became my side gig. As I read your book, the 24-hour soup kitchen, I had a little bit of whiplash. You know, one minute you're in Austin being one of a very few select guests at some gazillionaires, what, the introduction to art collectors of his third or fourth dining room with an installation of burnt millwork. And the next day you're feeding people in a truck with the sauce boss. I mean, it, it there's a, whoa, a kind of head spinning feeling when you go back and forth between the two worlds. Because as you pointed out, it wasn't just, it wasn't your world that you were leaving. You would be leaving as a reporter something so lofty and so beyond what we're well, all used well, right. to. And then go to the opposite which is also, in a way, hard to picture. But you do a very good job taking us to both sides of the coin. Oh, well, thank you. I I guess maybe some of those whiplashes that you experienced, you know, as a New Yorker, as you know, that's kind of what it's like to live in New York, where you're, you're seeing the most chic store or the most amazing apartment building, and then you're getting down into the subway and you're breathing in someone's piss. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's that's, just definitely, you yeah. know, that's kind of the wonder of New York in a way, or, or the wonder of any big city where you're on the one hand dazzled by something amazingly high and then suddenly a taxi goes by and you're splattered with, you know, something pretty low. Right. So I, I guess I... But yes, I mean, that, that is what the book brings the reader into, is these juxtapositions of, I mean, because you're not, you know, food and wine doesn't send you on a trip to write about a soup kitchen. They, they, they're they sending you to write about, you know, boutique sake manufacturers. Right. And so, which, you know, and it's great to know about boutique sake manufacturers, too, but to then have the opportunity to go learn about how food is made for Buddhist monks in Kyoto right. was equally as interesting to me. Um, of all the experiences that you had through the book, there were times when the volunteers with you were criminals who were um, an early parole or were thugs from the drug addicts, uh, street people who were part of the customer base would also have to volunteer. And you also went to neighborhoods where you probably didn't see a lot of people like you. Were you ever scared by the uh, universe that you were visiting for the day or two days that you were there? Um, yes. But, and, you know, again, this will sound like I'm trying to sound like I'm holy, which I am not. But I guess I just had a sense of if I'm going to get mugged or murdered or robbed or 
something terrible is going to happen to me. I guess I would rather have it happen to me in a soup kitchen than at a fashion show. Huh. You, Interesting. You know, that, yeah. You know, it just sort of seemed like, well, if, you know, if, if you know, if the Grim Reaper is going to come get me, let him get me here. But again, it was, uh, I've, I've done a lot of travel writing and I've traveled a lot. And I've been in some, you know, I'm not a war reporter by any means, but I've been in some rough situations and, I just, and as a New Yorker, you, you kind of know, you, have a, you begin to get a sense of radar of, am I safe here? And so I never felt really, really in danger. But I was aware of the fact that this is a, sometimes some, a funky neighborhood or a funky situation, sure. I mean, I, uh, in your book, uh, In Tiberius, the crew that you worked with were described as criminals. And the head of that to kitchen, which was a restaurant, said, oh, those are the criminals, or go talk to the criminals, or the criminals will do that, to the point where you you asked one of them, so what's your story? And he said, well, I just got out of prison. And from that to the story in Peru, where there were, believe me, I'd rather have criminals around than 50 guinea pigs at my feet. I thought about it. I mean, I reading your book, I asked myself that question, which would be worse for me? And it would certainly be the guinea pigs. Just saying. Well, yeah, except guinea pigs are really cute. Yeah. Well. Um, and, um, the, well, the thing, the, the criminals in Israel... Leave it to the Israeli government to come up with a really good idea, which we should probably do here in America, yeah. where, you know, youthful offenders, why are we warehousing them in prisons where they're just learning how to be, you know, worse, more hardened criminals? Right. These guys who have done soft crimes like, you know, credit card fraud or, you know, uh, you know, none of them were murderers or, or you know, they'd maybe stolen something. or And so the Israeli government says, you can either stay in prison or you can go work in a soup kitchen for a year or six months. And these, especially the ladies in Tiberias, these women that ran that soup kitchen, those boys, I'm sure, were more afraid of them than they were of their wardens in prison. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sure. Uh, last question before we get to your five things. You describe your childhood as the son of a Baptist minister, and you mention in your bio that you also attended a theology program at Yale or got your master's in theology at Yale. So obviously, in your DNA or in your heart or in your brain is that which is looking to find some deeper meaning and ask yourself some big questions. And yet, you also don't bring, you're not a practicing anything right now, if I understand. You're a, you're a thoughtful agnostic. I think that's right. I, I, I sometimes say that I'm a secular Christian or I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an ethnic Christian. Uh, you know, I think it's a little late in life for me to just declare myself a Buddhist or a Hindu, but, you know, because I was raised in Christianity, but right. I don't, most Christians would not consider me a Christian anymore. I, 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 but I'm fascinated by religion and spirituality and other people's quests and asking big questions. I, I want to be around those people and hear what they're thinking and, and feeling and maybe some of the answers they're coming up with. So for that reason, some of your friends, some of your, I'm going to say friends or quote unquote friends, sort of teased you or mocked you and said, who are you? You think you're so holy. And what is this, the magical misery tour? And they, what else did they call you? Mother Teresa or whatever. Why is it so controversial that a person who has done very well in his life wants to give back? Why, why does that deserve that kind of mockery? Or why does that elicit that kind of mockery? Well, I... Well, and believe me, I'm still getting it with the publication of this book and even talking to nice people like you, because, well, you know the dreaded phrase of virtue signaling. Yeah, I know what that you is. Know, it, it, there's just this sense that even if I did these things, I just should shut up about it and I shouldn't talk about it or that it's as if I'm saying, you know, praise me. And, and what I hope the book says is, you know, I'm, I'm a sinner. I'm a selfish, self-absorbed upper middle-class person who, you know, has a nice life. I'm, 
I'm I'm not I, I, I want to encourage other people to just occasionally do stuff like this and not feel like, oh well that's for social workers or that's for ministers or that's for rabbis to do or you know sadhus. Only holy people do I'll these things. I'll tell you, don't. I I I found myself wondering what kind of horrible friends you had, really, because to me there was none of that, oh look at what a saint I am. That didn't come through to me in your book at all. What came through was a desire to help maybe a small group of people, maybe a large group of people using skills that you already had. And you, and you're, and you make fun of yourself in the book. You say you brought, you know, kiwi fruit to a group that never had it and didn't need it. But, but I don't, I, I think you need new friends is what I'm trying to say. Oh well, I have I have great friends. I I have some, you know. I'm a gay guy. I've got snappy, bitchy friends too. So, you know, it's um, I I I, I don't I didn't take it all that seriously. I I get used to being teased. Okay, all right. Well, I'm glad uh, you felt the pain, though, Lisa. Thank you. I did. I hurt. I hurt for you. <laughs> and I and I I didn't really I, I didn't expect that. Um, Stephen, it's time for yes. your five things, and okay. you have a great list. And I'm oh, going to just say the number, and then you can tell us what it is. Okay. So for Stephen Henderson this week, number one. The New York Times. The Salzberger family. Thank you. <laughs> the, 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 the day does not begin until I actually have a hard copy of The New York Times. I I understand it it's it's nice to fold it's nice to smell it's nice to have it delivered it's, it's nice to rip things out of and tape them into your notebook. Yep. I just love, love, love it all. Thank you, Salzburger family. Yeah, I love the New York Times. Yeah. Who doesn't? And we love Who writing doesn't? for it too. Yeah, we sure do. We wish they paid better. Yeah, that's true. We do. Yeah. yeah. Number two. It's, a, it's, it's an yeah. honor to be published in the New it York Times. It certainly is. It certainly yes. is. Number two. Yes. This is interesting to me. Well, chock full of nuts. It's the heavenly coffee. Um, I love coffee. I'm a complete caffeine fiend. You know, with the New York Times in the morning, there has to be lots of black coffee. And, you know, I'm a cheap beer and a cheap coffee person. I do not need to have boutique, organic, you know, lovingly raised coffee. Chock full of nuts is perfectly fine with me. It's delicious. And I love the packaging. I love the packaging, too. I love the tin. And you can always use those tins. But it's interesting. I haven't heard anybody who talks about coffee to talk about a grocery brand. It's very, it's very interesting. I'm going to have to try it again. I used to love heavenly coffee. (laughs) I know it's heavenly. They used to have heavenly coffee shops. In I New know York. they did. Yeah. I know they did. They, they yeah. made heavenly well, donuts, by the way. When well, I loved donuts. recently that they had to have an ad saying it doesn't contain nuts. Oh. You know, because we it got come this nuts to that? going on. It's oh, come to that. It's come to that. Number three. Just the sheer wonder when you're in the kitchen and you don't have any kiwi to get on your phone and say, what's a good substitute for kiwi? Or you're too much kiwi. And to be able to type in, what's a good recipe with kiwi? And boink, I something know. just shows up. It's just amazing. I, I never get bored with that. It's just really a, a thrill of the 21st century. My 21st century uh, equivalent is the New York Times cooking app. Have you ever used oh, that? Well. Sure, of course, oh, of course. My God, yeah. that yeah. is yeah. responsible for my quarantine fifteen. Mm. I well, mean, they make okay. it too easy to cook. Well, that's the idea. Yeah, good for them. Good for them. Number four. Okay, um, I am a cementophile. Yes, I was socialized by Jews on the island. All my best friends have been Jewish. I I have a huge crush on Ben Mankiewicz, the host of Turner Classic Movies. He's a good-looking guy, yes. Good-looking guy, and so warm and funny and not making gross about the movies, but he kind of brings you in. Obviously, he knows everything, but he's generous with his knowledge. and just love everything about him, and I love Turner Classic Movies. I could just, I you know, I wouldn't watch it all day long, but, you know, it's a rare night that James and I don't at least see what's on. It's just the best. Well, and also we should say that 
Ben Mankiewicz, Handsome Ben, and his brother Josh. I guess they're brothers, or are they cousins? I don't know. Josh, oh, Ben is so oh, handsome. Uh, Josh is not quite as handsome. Uh, I, I hope Josh I, isn't listening. I hope he isn't. Uh, I worked with him once long ago. They are, well, let's just say Ben is the grandson, is he not, of Herman Mankiewicz? Well, yeah, you know, I can't keep I can't keep all the Mankiewiczes. You know, the Mankiewiczes. So many uh, Mankiewiczes. All, all so about little he, time. You know, producers. Yeah, he's he's Hollywood royalty. But he's he royalty it easily. Yes, yes, he does. He looks fine in a blazer too. Yeah, yeah. And number five. Well, I'm old school. I'm a journalist with a notebook and a pen. I like to write, and the usual jet stream retractable ballpoint pen is just heaven it never blots it never fails it runs smooth it has a perfect little nib it, it has a juicy enough line but it doesn't smear you know really i i'm not i'm not i'm a, I'm a seal for uniball here but yeah the, the, the pens are really 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 good i Cheap too uh, and do you use black or blue I, I, you know, I, I swing both ways. Really? I, I, you know, yeah, I'm flexible. You're bi. So, yeah, I am. I'm, I'm bi. I'm bi colored. Exactly. Well, so. that is a, a great list. Honestly, yeah. I use I use ballpoint pens, also uh, roller pens, rather, yeah. and I think that's the way to do it. Try it. The the point point oh seven millimeter fine point nib, life changer. Life changer. Okay. Hashtag life changer. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Stephen. And well. let me just say this to you and to the listeners. You've been listening to Five Things That Make Life Better with me, Lisa Birnbach. My guest this week has been Stephen Henderson, Stephen with a PH, author of The 24-Hour Soup Kitchen, Soul-Stirring Lessons in Gastrophilanthropy, published by Radius Book Group. You can follow Stephen on Instagram at Stephen Gordon Henderson or his website at the 24hoursoupkitchen.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Each positive review helps new listeners find our show. My blog is at lisabernbach.com, where you'll find links and photos to all the things in this program, including the Uniball. This podcast is produced in New York City by thefieldtv.com. My engineer is Kevin Watkins. My team is Espresso Arucci, Michael Port, Boko Haft, and Sam Haft. Until next week, wash your hands, stay home, and act natural. Bye-bye. That was Five Things with Lisa Bernbach. New episodes every Friday, if she remembers.